So welcome to chapter 13. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about proteins and what makes up a protein and what's it doing for us. Our objectives are going to be to learn terms and concepts regarding amino acids. We're going to learn about peptide bonds. We're going to learn what sort of functions proteins play in the body. And we're going to learn some general concepts about enzymes, which are proteins. And your homework is going to be that chapter 13 take-home quiz. So when we talk about proteins, proteins are um, going to be biological molecules like lipids, which means that they're not repeating units of smaller units like what we saw with carbohydrates. No, these guys are going to have different functional groups, and those functional groups are going to play a role in binding and the overall shape of this molecule. And um, with regard to um, proteins, the shape is just as important as what it's made of, its molecular composition. So we're going to look at all of that in this particular lecture. When we think about what proteins are doing for us, they're doing a lot of interesting things. They are enzymes, which you might remember are biological catalysts. They're uh, structures that speed up chemical reactions because many of the chemical reactions that are occurring in the body are happening so slowly that they wouldn't sustain life without the assistance of some sort of a catalyst to make them go faster. Proteins also act as cell receptors. So they are an interface between our little cells and the rest of the world because that's how a cell knows what's going on. That's how it takes a read of its environment is by having a receptor in its plasma membrane kind of uh, reading what chemicals are going by and being acti acted upon by various molecules which will trigger the cell to do certain things. Proteins also serve as structural support. So our collagen and our fibrin, those sorts of molecules that we think of that give like skin integrity or um, integrity to our, our tendons or our, or our ligaments or even our muscle tissue, these are all structural proteins. Now antibodies called immunoglobins, antibodies which are part of the immune system, they're proteins too. And then proteins can also be certain types of molecules that are involved in transportation. So hemoglobin, Hemoglobin is basically a protein molecule that has a place contained within it where uh, an oxygen can bind to an iron and it'll scoot around the body until it gets um, to its spot where it needs to be delivered. The same thing is true for myoglobin, which is um, a muscle-based um, oxygen transporter. So proteins are doing a lot of really interesting and amazing things for us. So let's talk a moment about amino acids. So why are amino acids going to be important to us? Because amino acids are going to be what make up proteins. Now what makes up an amino acid? Well, you're going to have an amine group, and an amine group is comprised of a nitrogen and a couple of hydrogens. You're going to have a carboxylic acid group, which is a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen and then also bonded to a hydroxide group. Where have we heard about that before? Well, that was what was on the end of most of our fatty acids from our lipid lecture. We talked about that. We also saw this group on the end of some of our um, sugar molecules, that carboxylic acid. So that's a reoccurring group that we're going to see in a lot of different um, bio biological-based molecules. So we have an amine group, we have a carboxylic acid, and then we have something that's called a side chain. And a side chain, I'm just going to kind of uh, hint to it at the moment. We're going to look at those side chains in a little bit more depth in a few slides. But a side chain is going to be um, a series of atoms going to be comprised of carbons, hydrogens, some oxygens, maybe some nitrogens, maybe even sulfur. And those are going to be coming off of a central carbon a as well as the carboxylic acid and the amine. So let's just bring in a molecule and put it together based upon what we see written here. So we're going to start with a carbon molecule. We're going to call this the alpha carbon. It's going to be the carbon uh, to which everything else is attached. So carbon will attach with four other molecules or four other um, um, not molecules, but atoms, molecules, meaning functional groups. And one of the functional groups that is going to be attached to carbon is going to be the amine functional group. So it's going to be attached to that amine by way of a nitrogen-carbon bond. 
So that's the amine group. And the carboxylic acid group is going to be attached by way of a carbon-carbon bond. And we can see that we have a doubly bonded oxygen. And then we have an, a hydroxide, also part of that carboxylic acid group. And then we have this side chain, which I'm generically referring to as R. And we've seen this reference before when we were in Chapter 6, taking a slight perusal through Chapter 7. And uh, R basically means that you've got some sort of a hydrocarbon conglomeration. It might have an oxygen in there. You might have a nitrogen in there. And that's what we're going to see with this side chain. It's going to be a bunch of different things, but we're just going to generically refer to it as R. And then the last thing that's going to be attached to this alpha carbon is a hydrogen. And this is your basic structure of an amino acid. Amino acids will always have an amine, it'll always have a carboxylic acid, it'll always have a hydrogen attached to that central carbon, and then also attached to that central carbon is going to be a side chain. Now we have 20 different amino acids, and what's going to make the difference between one amino acid and another one is going to be what's contained in that side chain. All right, so when we're looking at this amino acid, uh, there's some things that you need to know. Number one is that the amines are basically going to be organic bases. Well, what is a base? Well, a base is typically a molecule that can take on an extra proton or take on a hydrogen ion. That's what a base is. And we have um, the amine, which is right here, and that's going to be what's acting like a base. We have the carboxylic acid, which is this group over here. Well, what is the definition of an acid? Well, the defi definition of an acid is that it's a molecule that will give up a proton or give up a hydrogen ion, which is basically a proton and um, a neutron, no electron. Well, this guy is going to give up the hydrogen that it has, which is this hydrogen right there. And where is this hydrogen going to go? Over here to this part of the molecule, the basic part of the molecule. So instead of writing our amino acids like this, a lot of the time you're going to see them written like this, where that H has left the carboxylic acid end, and it's come over here to the amine end. And when it comes over here to the amine end, it's going to create a slight positive region around the nitrogen of the amine, and it's going to leave behind a slight negative area around the oxygen that, uh, that hydrogen left. And this is how amino acids exist in biological pH, which is the pH of the body. They have a tendency to um, undergo this sort of transition. And when we write amino acids this way, we call them zwitter ions. So that's a little bit about that. All right, so this is, I believe, it comes from the book. This is the picture that's in the book. It's the same thing that we just saw on the previous slide where we have the amine in blue off to the left, the carboxylic acid off to the right, um, that alpha carbon in the center, and attached to it is that side chain. Now, because the side chains are going to be different among all 20 different amino acids, we could say that it is the side chains that are the distinguishing feature from one amino acid to the other. Because every amino acid is going to have an amine group, every amino acid is going to have a carboxylic acid, and every amino acid is going to have a hydrogen, all attached to that alpha carbon. So it's the side chains that are going to be the, 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 um, the group that give an amino acid its identity. And in your book, you're going to see this picture right here. Uh, you're going to see one of a series of pictures that talk about the amino acids. And they've categorized them according to their polarity. So right here, we're looking at nonpolar amino acids. Your nonpolar amino acids are typically going to be made up mostly of side chains that involve carbon-hydrogen groups. You're going to see a few that have some other things, like this guy right here that has a nitrogen, and this guy over here that has a sulfur. But for the most part, if you look at what's in the pink boxes, these are the side chains, and they're mostly carbons and hydrogens. And the thing about carbon and hydrogen is that there's very little as far as difference in their electronegativity. Electronegativity meaning their ability to hold their electrons in close to them. And when there's not a lot of difference there, there's not going to be polarity.
the stronger an, uh, an atom can hold its electrons in, um, it will hug electrons to it, and it'll make it uh, have sort of a, a negatively charged cloud around it, which is going to leave some other part of the molecule with a slightly positive charge, and that creates polarity. So if we look at these, you'll see if we look at glycine, which is the first one in the top row off to the left, we see that it's going to have that amine group and then it has a carboxylic acid group. And we can see that this is the simplest of the R groups because it's only made up of a, just a simple H. A simple hydrogen is making up the R group in glycine. If we look at its neighbor, alanine, here's the amine group and here's the carboxylic acid group. And we can see that what's in the pink box is a slightly more complex side chain. Not real complex, it's basically just a methyl group. A little bit more complex than your basic hydrogen, um, but not a real complex one. Because if we look one more uh, amino acid to the right, valine, here's its amino acid and its carboxylic acid, I mean not amino acid, its amine group and its carboxylic acid group. And we can see that we've got a branched structure in its R group. And if we look one more to leucine, here's its amine, there's its carboxylic acid, and we can see it, it too has an increasingly more complex R group. And if we just look at all of these, we've got a wide variety of things taking place in these R groups. So R groups can be pretty simple, either being just a basic hydrogen or maybe even a methyl, or it can be like a double ringed group like what we see in tryptophan. Yeah, tryptophan has the nitrogen and methionine has that sulfur. Here we have um, some of the polar amino acids and these polar ones can be broken down into something that is considered acidic or something that's considered basic. And if we look at the ones that are acidic, if you look there at the end, you've got a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen and also being bonded to what, what was once a hydro... Um, oh, not... Uh, I just lost it. It's an OH, hydroxide. There we go. A hydroxide group. But because it's acidic, it's going to lose that hydrogen, leaving behind a slight negative charge, just like what we see with the basic structure of a Zwitter ion, that hydrogen coming off that hydroxide group that's attached to that carbon. So we have a couple of um, acidic amino acids, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. Those are uh, named acid because of their nature. Here in the blue we see the basic amino acids and these are the ones that have found the hydrogens that were surrendered by those acidic amino acids. So if we look at um, lysine for example, right here we have a nitrogen group that has a slight positive charge because it's actually gained a hydrogen. Might have come from maybe this guy, might have come from this guy, we don't really know. We just know that there's an extra hydrogen here which is going to render that slight positive charge around this nitrogen. What we have here, the same thing. This nitrogen has picked up an extra hydrogen which has led to that positive charge. And oops, right there got the same thing. So we can now classify these amino acids as either being polar acidic or polar basic because of the transfer of those hydrogens. Yep, acidic and basic. There's my arrows. And we have polar neutral. Polar neutral means that these are neither acidic or basic, but they have polarity because they contain within their R groups a molecule, not a molecule, an atom that has high electronegativity, an atom that has a tendency to hug in its electrons really close and anybody else's electrons that get close to it. So for example, oxygen, oxygen is a big electron hog. It's going to have a tendency to create polarity. So it's going to hug in the hydrogen, the electrons off this hydrogen. It might even try to hug in some electrons off of these two hydrogens. But anyway, it's going to end up with a, a slightly negative uh, cloud around it. So the, uh, these R groups that have these side chains that have oxygens in them are going to be big electron hogs, which means that this will have a slight negative charge to it. Sulfur can do the same thing. Um, it kind of falls within that same um, region as oxygen does as far as electro ele uh, electronegativity. And the same thing is true for nitrogen. So that's why all of these guys are considered polar, um, but they're neutral because they haven't overtly donated or gained an electron, leaving behind some sort of an overt charge. They basically just have a slight negative uh, cloud around them because of their tendency to hug in someone else's electrons. Neutral, yes. 
All right, essential amino acids. Now, we've seen the term essential before. We saw it when we were talking about fatty acids. We talked about essential fatty acids. And what did we say about essential fatty acids? We said that these were fatty acids that had to be taken in in the diet because our magnificent livers could not make uh, essential fatty acids from other things that were consumed. So yeah, we have essential fatty acids that we have to take in from the diet because we can't make them from other stuff that gets consumed. And we have the same thing being true for amino acids. So essential amino acids must be supplied through diet because our magnificent livers cannot make them through other um, intermediates of metabolic processes. Now there's nine of these. Nine out of the 20 amino acids are essential amino acids. And the good news here is that I don't expect you to know what those nine are. I just want you to know what an essential amino acid is and that they do exist. And if you needed to come up with whether an amino acid was essential or not, you could probably look it up. All right. When we talk about amino acids, all of them are going to be found in some sort of an animal product, whether it's the animal flesh itself, such as the muscle of the animal. That's what we're eating when we eat chicken or when we eat steak or when we eat fish. We're eating the animal uh, muscle because it's made up of protein, which is made up of amino acids. Also animal products. So things like milk and cheese from cows or sheep uh, or even goats. Um, those products contain a fair amount of protein which will contain amino acids. Also eggs contain a lot of protein and will contain a lot of amino acids as a result of that. So as long as you're eating meat and fish and uh, animal products, you're probably gonna be getting enough amino acids. But what if you're a vegetarian or a vegan? Then you're gonna be a little bit challenged because you're not gonna have those easy sources of amino acids by way of other animal proteins in your diet. So people that are vegetarians have to be really careful about getting lysine and methionine in their diets. And they have to use uh, combinations of grains and legumes in order to make sure that they're getting um, things that can make these two amino acids in particular. So a certain amount of supplementation might also be necessary uh, when you're looking at proteins. And believe it or not, animal proteins are not the same across the board. Um, cultures that eat a lot of sheep have to include a little bit of sheep in their diet every week in order to get for their bodies to be able to extract the proteins efficiently. If you take a, a person who has been mostly uh, getting their protein from sheep meat, they still need to eat a little bit of sheep protein even if they've like um, eating a lot of cow protein. So people that have um, have a long heritage being in Australia, people of Northwestern European descent who have a long history of being in Australia, like maybe from the early penal colony days, still need to eat a little bit of sheep protein because that's a large part of the, the Australian diet. So if they were to come to America and eat mostly a beef-based diet, they might start to feel something lacking and they would do better if they just incorporated just a meal just as little as three ounces, I believe, or maybe even nine ounces in the course of a month would be enough to give them what they need. Same thing is true for someone who's like a, a, a beef eater. You go into, go into a culture where they eat a lot of sheep, like um, the Arab cultures where they eat a lot of sheep, um, and then you try to put them on a sheep-based diet without a lot of um, cow protein, you'll start to feel a deficiency after a while. So not all proteins can be created the same. They're, um, they're good sources, but uh, you may have to vary it up and look to your heritage to see what it is that you need to be eating. All right. Chirality. Do you remember what chirality is? Well, chiro means hand. That's what a chiropractor is all about. Chiropractors adjust with their little hands. And chiro means hand in Greek. So chirality is handedness, because remember, these molecules exist in three dimensions and how they exist in three dimensions does play a role in their function. Some things kind of, you know, are left-handed. We can consider them a left-handed molecule. Some things are a right-handed molecule. And 19 of the 20 amino, amino acids have chirality. And what determines the chirality is the amine group off of that central carbon. So if the amine group is off to the left, it's an L amine. If that amine group is off to the right, it's considered a D amine. And if 19 of the 20 have chirality, then there's one that doesn't. The one that doesn't is glycine. And why is that? 
because coming off of that central carbon, that uh, alpha carbon is a, a, an amine group and a carboxylic acid, and then we have two hydrogens. And because the hydrogens are the same, which basically means the R group is the same as the hydrogen, um, there's no real handedness to that. When it, however you write this molecule, it's going to basically be able to take it and put it on top of it itself and stack it, and it's going to be identical. That's the definition of handedness. If you need a reminder of that, take your right hand and place it on top of your left hand. And even though both of your hands have four fingers and a thumb, your thumbs are oriented in different directions, and it is the thumb that gives your hand the handedness. Um, so just like uh, we have to ascribe something, so we in in the case of uh, amino acids, we look to the amine group to tell us whether we're left-handed or right-handed. So that's a little bit about chirality of amino acids. What is a peptide? Well, a peptide is a chain of amino acids, and they are linked uh, in a particular way. And we're going to talk about the peptide bond in just a second. So a peptide is basically a couple of amino acids strung together in a short chain. A dipeptide is two amino acids put together in a bond, and a polypeptide is when you have more than two. So it could be three, it could be four, it could be five. The interesting thing is, is that just because you're starting to string amino acids together doesn't mean that you immediately have a protein. Making a protein is a really complex process, and you have to have a certain number of amino acids in your chain before you can even consider that chain anywhere near being a protein. And different sources will tell you different things. Some sources will tell you that it needs to be at least 50 amino acids in a chain before it's considered a protein. Some other sources will tell you that it needs to be between 80 and 100. The reason why we get so much variability about how many amino acids need to be in that chain is because it's not just the amino acids in the chain that make up a protein, it's the shape of the protein once those amino acids are put in place, because amino acids, because of that polarity and the dispersion forces and some other things that we're going to look at in a few more slides, uh, or a few slides from now, those are going to cause a folding pattern to happen. So it's not just the amino acids that make up the protein or the sequence of amino acids, it's actually the shape that they take that leads to the functionality of a protein. So if you don't have enough amino acids in place for the right shape to take place, then you don't have a functional protein. It, they it would still be classified as just a chain of amino acids, which is called a peptide. So that's why you would see different numbers of amino acids being present in a chain before you considered it a protein, because it's possible that you could have a protein that was 50 amino acids in length. It's also possible that you had 80 amino acids in length, and it would not be considered a functional protein because it's not doing the thing it needs to be doing yet. So that's a little bit about that. It'll make sense, I think, in a few more slides. So let's talk about this peptide bond. So the way that amino acids are put together is going to be as important to the function of a protein as the amino acids that are included in the recipe for making a protein. And putting the amino acids together happens in a real specific fashion. And what's going to happen is that you're going to have the amine of one amino acid joining with the carboxylic end of another amino acid in order to create what's called a peptide bond. And if you look at the picture here, we have amino acid 1 on the left and amino acid 2 on the right. And what we see happening here is that this oxygen is going to become liberated from this carbon. And these two hydrogens are going to become liberated from this nitrogen. And it is this nitrogen and this carbon that are going to create the bond right here, which is called a peptide bond. Now, in liberating an oxygen and two hydrogens, what are we going to make? We're going to make some water. That's what we're going to do. And when we go from two amino acids being strung together to create this little peptide bond, this is called an amidation reaction. Now, it's entirely possible that we could break this bond. And in order to do that, it's going to require a water molecule that we're going to have to take apart because we're going to have to restore an oxygen here on this carbon and restore two hydrogens here on this amine. And when we do that, we would call this a hydrolysis reaction. 
All right, so in a little bit more detail, looking at the amidation reaction, if we have a, t a couple of amino acids. They're going to be oriented kind of like what we see here. We have a carboxylic acid end and an amino acid end, um, an amine end on our amino acid. And an oxygen is going to come off of that carboxylic acid. And a couple of hydrogens are going to come off of the nitrogen. And these atoms that we see here in purple are going to leave those two amino acids and become a water molecule. And here they are becoming a water molecule. Now what's left is an unattached carbon and an unattached nitrogen. It is this carbon and this nitrogen coming together that's going to create the peptide bond. So we can show that. So if we bring down that amino acid from the left, and we drop in the amino acid from the right, we can see that what we have right here is a union that is created from the carbon of the carboxylic acid and the nitrogen of the amine group, and we've created a peptide bond. And because we have only two amino acids here in this little peptide chain, we would call it a dipeptide. So that is basically the what's happening in an amidation reaction, and we start putting amino acids together. All right, and this is it one more time. So this is, I believe, the image from your book. So hopefully that makes this image from your book a little bit more clear that we're taking um, the oxygen from the carboxylic acid end and two hydrogens from the amine end and allowing space for the carbon and the nitrogen to come together to create that peptide bond. Yep, all of that. All right. So when we put a, a series of amino acids together, that's how they're going to go. It's going to be uh, orienting the carboxylic acid end and the amine end so that we grow that amino acid chain. And because one of the things that's important is the sequence of amino acids in creating our specific proteins, it's going to start at one end and finish at the other. So they uh, these peptides uh, are going to be created in a head-to-tail fashion and we're going to start with the N terminus so we're going to have a free amine end and what's going to be on the other side of that amine of this first amino acid it is its carboxylic acid and its carboxylic acid the carbon from that is going to join with the uh, nitrogen of the amine of our second amino acid so I'm talking about this union right here. And then if we're going to string another amino acid in this chain, then we have to go to the carboxylic acid of our second amino acid and have it join with the amine of our third amino acid. And if we were going to add a fourth amino acid to this group, or to this growing peptide chain, we would come here and we would uh, liberate this carbon, so that oxygen would go, and then the amine group of our fourth amino acid would fit in and create another peptide bond right here. So we start off with our N terminus, that's our free amine N. Amine has a nitrogen in it, designated by the letter N. And then we have what's called the C terminus, which is the free carboxylate or the carboxylic acid in, and it's the carbon that we're interested in there. So that's where the N and the C come from in our N terminus and our C terminus. So that's a, a kind of an important concept that, we're, that when we're making these polypeptides, which are going to eventually become big enough to become um, the foundations of our proteins. This is how we sequence those amino acids. That's how we put the first one with the second one and then the second one with the third one is through this head to tail fashion. All right, once we've had a sequence of amino acids joined together, how do we name this, uh, this peptide chain? How do we name that? Well, we list the amino acids using their abbreviations. So, for example, in this picture, that ALA stands for alanine, the GLY stands for glycine, the VAL stands for valine, and I'm finding those right here, alanine, glycine, and valine. And we start naming over here at the N terminus, there's my N, and we head towards the C terminus, there's my C terminus right there. So if we were to string these together in our growing amino acid chain, hopefully someday to become a protein, 
if you were going to name this and you're going to list these all out, that's how you would do that. You would just take the abbreviation of the amino acid and put them in that sequence. Good news is, is we don't have to do that. But I do want you to have an understanding that if you were to see the name of, an, of a peptide chain, and you were to see that ALA and the GLY and the VAL, you'd understand what that is. And you would understand that naming it starts at the N terminus and heads towards the C terminus uh, in order to be complete. All right. So I believe this is from your book where it says proteins are made from uh, upwards of 50 amino acids to thousands of amino acids, typically are, uh, less than 2,000, at least in our bodies, less than two acids, uh, 2,000 uh, acids. So there's a lot of variation there between 50 amino acids and 2,000 amino acids. The average protein in our body contains less than 2,000 amino acids. And typically chains of less than 30 amino acids are considered non-proteins. We would still call those peptide chains as a result of that, because again, that idea of are they big enough to be functional? Do they have the right number of things um, in order to have the right shape to do the right stuff? So amino acid sequences for proteins are encoded in our DNA. And this is how our bodies know how to make various proteins. So when we talk about making uh, proteins and we're doing that whole DNA transcription and translation business, those base pairs that are in our DNA, the A, C, G, T, all of that sort of stuff, the way that those are sequenced, that's basically the recipe for various amino acids. That's what that's telling us, which is amazing if you think about it. There are three general classes of proteins. We have what are called fibrous proteins, which are typically structural. We have globular proteins, which um, are things that are scooting around the bloodstream, typically. And then we have membrane proteins, which are going to be found in membranes. You got it, as the name implies. So let's take a look at those. So a fibrous protein is going to be strong and water insoluble, which means it's not going to dissolve in water, which is good because you wouldn't want things like your collagen dissolving in water. That could be a problem. Our skin would sag real early. You don't want that. Not any sooner than it has to happen. And among the fibrous proteins are the keratins, and keratin is what's, what makes up your hair and your nails. Uh, elastins, this is what we find in our skin and in our blood vessels. Got a, got a lot of that in our lungs, too. Lungs basically rely upon recoil for us to breathe out. It's only breathing in that is active. Breathing out is passive, and it's due to the elastic fibers in our lungs. They're like, um, you know, stretched out pieces of elastic. When we breathe in, we stretch out the elastic, and when we want to breathe out, we just kind of let go, and the recoil of the tissues forces the air out. Uh, tendons also included in here. Then we have collagens, which is uh, are fibers that we're going to find in skin and bone and cartilage as well as ligaments and tendons. So these are our fibrous proteins. These are the things that are going to give basically our structures um, and various body components integrity. Uh, going to keep things in place and have them work the way we want them to and be strong while they're doing it. That's what we like from our fibrous proteins. Strength. Globular proteins. These are going to be um, big protein chains that are folded up into kind of rounded spherical shapes. Hemoglobin is a really good example of this. And this is what we see pictured right now on the screen. So I'll give you a quick little tour here. Hemoglobin is made up of four protein uh, chains. Here's one. This purple one is another one. Here's a, a pink one. And then this brown one back here is one. And we call them beta chains and alpha chains, uh, mostly because, I guess, of how they're positioned. And right in here is where we're going to find our uh, heme group, which is where it's labeled right here, our heme group that has the iron in it. And when uh, hemoglobin binds with oxygen, it's going to bind that oxygen right here on that little iron dot. So that's how that works. But the way the overall structure of this hemoglobin uh, protein is put together is basically round. That's why it's called globular, because it's round. And then our third type of protein is membrane proteins. These are the ones that are going to uh, be embedded into the plasma membranes of cells. And a, a typical function of a, a protein found in the membrane is that it's going to be a channel, which is basically a doorway that's going to allow certain 
molecules or certain ions into the cell and out of the cell. So it's a door, is what it is. And its shape allows for kind of um, things to be open and closed. The other thing that a protein might be doing if it's found in the plasma membrane is that it might be acting as a receptor site. So it's like a docking station for a hormone of some sort. And as we are going to learn about proteins, the shape of the protein is really important because it's the, the protein needs to be able to receive another large molecule, such as a, a protein-based hormone, in order to engage that locking um, and key mechanism that is inherent in a receptor binding site. So these are uh, some interesting things that proteins are doing for us. So I've alluded to this several times already in this lecture that the shape of the protein is really important. And when we talk about the shape of a protein, we refer to it as its native conformation. And native conformation um, for in the book is described as how proteins exist in three dimensions. And the reason why this is really important is because the function of a protein relies not only in the amino acids that make it up, not only in how those amino acids are put in sequence, but also on the shape of the protein. Yes, I said the shape of the protein. So when we're going to make a protein, we have to think about four levels of protein architecture. And we call them the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, structure, I'll get it out here, and the quaternary structure. Let's look at each one of those and see what is involved. So when we talk about the primary structure of proteins, the very first thing that we're going to be concerned with when we're talking about primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. So it's not like we can just take all the amino acids that we need and throw them in a big bowl and stir them up. We have to put them in a specific order because amino acids are strung together in a head-to-tail fashion. They create a sequenced chain. And the sequence of those amino acids is going to give us a particular type of protein. So primary structure is the amino acid sequence. So when we put amino acids together, keep in mind, we might have this amino acid that we're going to create a peptide bond with, with a second one, and maybe a third one, and maybe a fourth one. Yep, all those peptide bonds coming together. And this sequence is going to be really important to us. Now, I haven't designated this because I haven't filled out the R, the R groups or the side chains, but we might have an amino acid sequence that is glycine, alanine, lysine, and serine. And that sequence would be really important to us, uh, important enough that we call it the primary structure. So again, that is primary structure, the first thing that we're concerned with when we set about making a protein. Now the secondary structure is going to involve a folding pattern. And because these are really large molecules, I mean, if you look at an amino acid, it's got a carbon, it's got a nitrogen with three hydrogens, it's got another carbon with uh, two oxygens, it's got a hydrogen attached, and then it's got some sort of an elaborate side chain. And with all of those different atoms in place, there's going to be a lot of different intermolecular forces that could come to play. Because what if you had um, uh, an amino acid side chain that was an acid? And it had that overt negative charge. And right next to it, you had an amino acid that was basic with that overt uh, positive charge. Those would be attracted to each other. In fact, they would be so attracted to each other that they might actually create an intermolecular force that would cause the chain to bend around that reaction. And that's what we see happening with the secondary structure. It's based upon a folding pattern, and it's specifically the folding pattern that can occur by way of the polypeptide backbone. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is a picture from your book. I happen to think this is a little bit confusing because it's hard to see where the amine group is and where the carboxylic acid group is and where the peptide bonds are. And I'll point them out. Here's our N-terminus, so there's our first amine group. Here's the carbon of the carboxylic acid bonded with the amine of the next amino acid. So there's a union. Here's another union. Here's another union. And is there a possibility that this chain would have some sort of a reaction with itself? And the answer is absolutely yes. Let's take a look at why that's the case. Oh, I did draw circles here. Here they are. 
Okay, nice. So if we look at what's happening, when we say the polypeptide backbone, what I mean is the backbone formed by the amino acid, car uh, the uh, amine carboxylic acid groups. What I mean is the amine carboxylic acid groups. Because what do we have off of these groups? We have oxygen. Oxygen is an electron hog. And we have hydrogens. Oxygen likes to share the electrons of hydrogen. So what can end up happening is that these oxygens and these hydrogens can create side reaction. They can create hydrogen bonds. So what might end up happening is that the hydrogen of one uh, region might be interacting with an oxygen of another region and it's going to cause that chain to fold in on itself as a result of these interactions occurring between the amines and the carboxylic acid regions of this backbone. So the secondary structure has to do with hydrogen bonding of the amine carboxylic acid backbone. That's what we see here in this pink square. Now what kind of shapes can we get? Well, we can get a shape that looks like this, this sort of curly Q helical thing. And in fact, we call this shape an alpha helix. And if we look at this picture, what we see is that this hydrogen and this oxygen have created a hydrogen bond and that it's holding this chain in this structure right here. We can see the same thing has happened here. A uh, hydrogen bonding occurring between this oxygen and this hydrogen various parts of the chain. And the same thing happening here, and the same thing happening here. So in, under the right circumstances, we'll get this shape. Now there's another possibility that could arise as a result of the hydrogen bonding happening across the length of our amino acid chain, and that is something known as the, yep, there those are, as the um, beta sheet. And it looks a little bit like corrugated tin. And if we look at this one, we can also see the hydrogen bonding occurring across the length of the amino acid chain. But uh, instead of it being the curly Q, it ends up looking like this. So these are the two possible um, configurations caused by the secondary structure, which is that folding due to the hydrogen bonding of the amine carboxylic acid backbone. And yeah, this is a nice picture, nice and colorful, kind of gives you again what that looks like. So a lot of times if you're looking online and you're trying to find a protein, you'll see all these little curly cues. Those are your alpha helices. And you'll see these straight lines that look like a uh, waffle potato chip, um, you know, kind of basket weave. Those are going to be your beta pleats. That's how the artists draw those. That's, that's what that means. All right, so we've talked about our primary structure and our secondary structure. What about our tertiary structure? Well, our tertiary structure is another folding pattern, but it's not necessarily the folding pattern of the amine carboxylic acid backbone. We've already talked about that. This is a folding pattern that's based upon those side chains. Your book refers to them as the prosthetic groups. But it's those side chains, because some of those side chains have positive and negative charges. Some of them are polar. And they're going to create different sort of attractions between the side chains, and those are going to uh, create another level of bonding. And some of the forces that are at work here under the tertiary structure, some of the things that can happen between those side chains are disulfide bridges, salt bridges, hydrogen bonding, just like what we saw happening with our secondary structure, and dispersion forces. So we're going to take a look at those. Don't feel like you need to write these down quickly because I'm going to go over this in, a, in another slide and make it much clearer what I'm talking about. All right, so earlier we talked about this region right here, the amine carboxylic acid backbone. Now we're going to talk about what's happening with these various R structures. And you can have a lot of things happening because there's a lot of different R structures. So it is the interaction between these side chains that are going to lead to another layer of folding, which is going to be our tertiary structure. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here we have all of these nonpolar amino acids, a bunch of uh, hydrogens and carbons coming together. They have a tendency to not have any um, areas of localized charge 
as a result. But what can happen is that every now and then, somebody ends up with all their electrons when those electrons are orbiting. Electrons might end up in one area. And when that happens, you can like create a transient negative charge, because that does happen. And uh, when you get that transient negative charge, then other molecules in the area that might be nonpolar will suddenly decide that they want to have all of their electrons on one side too and have a transient charge and they'll do the same thing and that's what's called a dispersion force and it's a, a really quick and fleeting uh, intermolecular force but it does exist it's, it, it, in fact this is the one force that exists between all molecules and um, we can have that happening with within all these nonpolar um, side chains. So there's your nonpolars. Here we have our polar amino acids. Again, we've seen these once before. We've got the um, acidic ones with these negative uh, charges because they've surrendered their hydrogens. The hydrogens had to go somewhere and they came over here to the basic ones. The basic ones were able to accept those hydrogen charges. So our acidic ones and our basic ones, those charges are going to have um, uh, interactions uh, among the side chains and that's going to create one of those um, intermolecular forces that were listed. Uh, like I said, I'm just kind of reviewing the structure of the side chain so that we know what we're dealing with in the next couple of slides. So let's look at another one. Um, here we have our neutral um, but polar amino acids and these are going to be polar because the presence of this big old um, electron hog oxygen right here. Um, oxygen likes to bind with the neighboring hydrogens to create hydrogen bonds. Sulfur is going to do the same thing and um, nitrogen is going to also do the same thing. Nitrogen has a tendency to also be an electron hog and uh, so if there's any hydrogens in the neighboring region like in like if it's being uh, twisted over and there happens to be some hydrogens that are lined up just right it'll create a really strong intermolecular force. So let's look at those intermolecular forces in a bit more detail. All right, so we just went through all the amino acids and we saw they could be really simple like glycine or it could be something a little bit more uh, complicated like tryptophan. And it's these side chains that are going to create these uh, intermolecular forces that are going to cause that tertiary structure, that second level of folding. So one of these uh, tertiary intermolecular forces is going to be by way of something known as a salt bridge. Now in chemistry, when you have the attraction of uh, positive and negative charges, what results is something called salt. And in this reaction where we have the attraction of these positive and negative charges, we would call that a salt bridge. So we have the negative charge of one uh, side chain interacting with the positive charge of another side chain, and that is leading us to the creation of a salt bridge. The other possibility is that you have a couple of amino acids that are side by side and they have or eventually located next to each other, I shouldn't say side by side, but next to each other in close proximity. And if they have uh, these sulfurs, not the hydrogen, but they have sulfurs, sulfur will have a, a, a tendency to create what's known as a disulfide bridge. That means a reaction between two sulfurs. Di means two. So a disulfide bridge is going to be the reaction between a couple of side chains that have the, the sulfurs in them. The other possibility is that you're going to have this hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is going to occur, for example, between the hydrogen of one group and maybe a nitrogen of another one or maybe um, an oxygen and a reaction between a hydrogen. So these are three of the strongest possible intermolecular forces. The fourth one would be those dispersion forces. So what it, would I like you to know about that? I would like for you to be able to identify if I showed you a picture of something like this where there was a connection between these two sulfurs to know that that's a disulfide bridge. I'd like for you to know that if you saw a connection between two side chains where one of them had a negative charge and the other one had a positive charge, that that would be a salt bridge. I would like for you to know that if I showed you hydrogen interacting with a nitrogen that you're looking at a hydrogen bond. That's what I'd like for you to take away from this. And I'd like for you to understand that those reactions between side chains is your tertiary structure, your second layer of folding that happens in the formation of your protein. Now technically at this point we could have an amino acid chain 
that is big enough and has folded properly and is functional all on its own. That's a possibility. However, more likely than not, it's going to need to be part of what's known as the quaternary structure. So let's take a look at what quaternary structure is. Oh, I guess we're not done with the uh, tertiary structure. I'm doing these on the fly because uh, I'd have to like write out an entire script and I don't want to do that. So here's our tertiary structure. Uh, there's our R groups. They're going to interact um, and it's going to lead to another layer of folding kind of like that. All right, so if we had um, our protein and it was done uh, up to the tertiary structure, it is possible, as I was saying, that this could be a functional protein. The other possibility is that this protein might just be a subunit of a, a, a a, a grouping of sub of other proteins and it requires that grouping of all these little proteins in order for us to have a functional protein so our little protein that we just made by doing the the primary structure secondary stru structure and our tertiary uh, tru structure I'll get it all out in a second um, might just be only a subunit in fact we might need let's say maybe another three in order to create a functional protein and when we have this scenario this is what we call the quaternary structure so this is when our little protein that we created by the first three levels of protein uh, architecture requires that it plays a role as a subunit of a larger functional protein complex so um, yeah it's just you know a player and it won't be active until it joins up with its buddies and forms a gang and then they can go out and do something that's quaternary structure all right, quaternary structure describes the interaction of two or more polypeptide chains that create an overall shape and function of that protein. I showed you the picture. Hopefully, it makes sense to you. So putting it all together, amino acid sequence is our primary structure. Secondary structure is the alpha helix, maybe the beta sheet. I didn't include that here, but that's that folding pattern because of the amine carboxylic acid backbone, the two functional groups that are present in every amino acid having some sort of interaction. The tertiary level of folding is based upon the side chains and the quaternary structure. Our hemoglobin is a perfect example of that because just a, a chain of hemoglobin isn't, isn't um, going to be good enough. It needs to be part of a, uh, uh, a set of these chains in order for it to be a functional hemoglobin. And that is a perfect example of quaternary structure. All right, so what happens if we change the native conformation of our protein? What if we change its shape? Well, believe it or not, the protein, even if it still has the same sequence, if it doesn't have the correct folding pattern, it's no, long, no longer going to have the same sort of function that it once had. So how can protein shape be disrupted? Well, heating it. So if you were to take protein out of its uh, environment and like cook it, that'll change its shape. Uh, if you change the pH of the environment, that'll change the shape. Um, you can actually take proteins out of their um, environment and put them in a test tube and shake them, and that'll change the shape. And then certain detergents or metals, because you know these things have charge. We don't, we haven't studied detergents, but detergents typically have like a phosphate group on them, and phosphate has charge, and it also has some other ways to disrupt um, shape. Uh, and uh, the same thing is true with metals because metals have charge to them as well. That can disrupt some of those folding patterns. And once you disrupt those folding patterns, even if that's all you disrupt, then you're going to change the shape of the protein and you're going to change its, its uh, functionality. In fact, that's what happened with mad cow disease. Mad cow disease is a, a protein that lost its correct folding pattern. And it's a protein that occurs naturally in tissues. But it lost its folding pattern and it's now uh, a brain-eating uh, little structure that it has devastating effects. So yeah, denaturing proteins can end up being some pretty serious business. All right, let's talk about enzymes. Enzymes are catalysts for biological reactions. Basically, a catalyst is something that gets added to a chemical equation 
or a chemical reaction rather, that can speed the reaction along without becoming part of that reaction. So typically what it's doing is it's causing an alternate path to be created chemically so that it just happens quicker than it would under nor normal circumstances. Enzymes are necessary for life because without enzymes in our body, many of the reactions that we need in order to sustain life would not happen quickly enough. Most of our biological catalysts speed up reactions like a million times faster. Mighty fast, those enzymes can make things happen mighty fast and I'm glad they do. All right, enzymes are going to be something that act upon substrates. And there's two things that can happen with an enzyme. Enzymes can either create, I don't think I go into it on this slide or even on our next couple of slides, but enzymes can either cause uh, the creation of new compounds, like maybe taking two small molecules and knitting them together. That could be an enzymatic reaction. Or it could take a large molecule and break it into smaller compounds. Um, and that could be an enzymatic reaction. So you could have degradation reactions and then you can have, oh, I just lost the language. Um, oh, degradation. I can't remember what the other one is. Uh, where you make stuff. <laughs> I can't remember the name. It's not part of the, the lecture, but I just wanted to, to present that. What we see here in this equation is that we have E stands for enzyme. The enzyme comes along our enzyme right here comes along and it works on a substrate. Let's say that we want to break down milk sugar. That's a good substrate to break down. The enzyme and the substrate we join together in something that we call the enzyme substrate complex. And as a result of the enzyme working on our substrate, in this case it's going to take the substrate and it's going to break it down into, let's say, something smaller like a couple of simple sugars. That would be our product. But then our enzyme would be released and it would be allowed to go find another substrate and work on it and do it again. So our enzymes never get degraded in the process. It just kind of enters in and says, oh, I'm going to go along for the ride. We're going to make sure it goes really fast and bam, it's done. Then off it goes to find another substrate to work on. That's the nature of an enzyme. All right, so here we have, I believe, an, in, an image that's from your book. And let's say that we were working on a substrate that was lactose. Lactose is the sugar that we find in milk. And we would have an enzyme called lactase. Let's hope you have that enzyme, because if you don't, you lead to some nasty belly upset when you don't have lactase um, in your intestines. You can't break down that milk sugar. Because milk sugar is actually a pretty big sugar. It's a couple of... Um, sugar rings that are strung together. So what would end up happening is that lactase and lactose would find each other. They would form that enzyme substrate complex and then as a result of that reaction it would cause that lactose to be broken down into two simpler sugars like D-galactose and D-glucose. And then our enzyme is free to go find another lactose to work on so that we can make sure that we're breaking down that milk the way we need to. In order for enzymes to work, they have to occur at the correct pH. And they also have to work at the correct body temperature. Most enzymes have a tendency to work at a pH of 7.4. Most, but not all. Because think about your stomach. pH isn't 7.4 in there. No, no. Um, and a lot of uh, enzymatic reaction uh, relies upon feedback. Uh, of the body and in fact some of it might even rely upon feedback inhibition to stop things because remember wherever the body creates a gas pedal it's going to create uh, a break and if we, I'm going to go back a slide actually I can't go back a slide because if I do I'll just record over it so if you have this free floating enzyme it's going to work on any substrate that it finds and we have to have a way to create uh, a feedback mechanism that says you know what we've done enough breaking down of milk products so let's stop that so that's part of the feedback inhibition, and we are going to look at that in just a little bit. But for now, let's take a look at, at uh, pH. So the stomach pH comes in at um, between 1 and 2 on our pH scale. And this is great for a type of an enzyme known, uh, that known as pepsin. Pepsin is great um, at pH of 1 or 2. It doesn't work so good when the pH goes up and becomes more alkaline. Pepsin is not as effective as that. So pepsin works almost exclusively in the stomach. 
We have an enzyme in our mouth known as amylase. The pH for amylase, optimal pH for amylase is 7, which is what we have in our mouths. By the time that amylase hits the belly, it's not going to work so good anymore because the pH is just too harsh for that enzyme. Um, and it, it stops, um, it no longer has its functionality. High fevers can actually alter that word's supposed to be some enzyme reactions um, because certain pH, uh, certain enzymes need to be working at a, a particular temperature. And if your body temperature gets too high for too long, you can um, inhibit some enzymes from working. So how do we go about inhibiting enzymes? What is the breaking mechanism that Mother Nature has provided in order for us to stop enzymes from working? Well, we have two basic concepts that we're going to look at here. One is called a competitive inhibitor, and the other one is a non-competitive inhibitor. All right, so a competitive inhibitor is going to be a molecule that is going to compete with a substrate to bind to the enzyme. Now, in my little image here, what you see is that this binding site for my competitive inhibitor is identical to the binding site for my substrate. And the substrate and my competitive inhibitor are going to fit beautifully with my enzyme. The difference being that if my competitive inhibitor comes and lodges right here, nothing happens. It's not, the enzyme is not going to break down this competitive inhibitor. There's not going to be any sort of reaction that occurs. And as long as that competitive inhibitor is bound to that enzyme, that enzyme is going to be rendered inactive. It can't be free to work on the substrate. And sometimes we want that. Sometimes the products of the substrate drives other reactions in the body, and we don't necessarily want those reactions to go forward. So the body then starts to allow these competitive inhibitors to be created, to bind to the enzymes until we need more of whatever gets created by the enzyme and the substrate being bound together. That's the nature of a competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor will bind to an active site and prevent some other reaction from taking place um, by keeping that thing from binding at that site. So an example is the ACE inhibitors for hypertension. Now what about a non-competitive inhibitor? Well, a non-competitive inhibitor is going to bind to an enzyme, but it's not going to bind at the uh, active site. It's going to bind elsewhere to the uh, enzyme. And it's going to alter that native conformation, because remember these enzymes are going to be proteins. And the functionality of a protein is, 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 it's, it, is its shape. So if we attach a molecule elsewhere to that protein and it causes that protein to maybe twist and distort a little bit, then the binding site is no longer going to fit the substrate like it once did. So let's see what I got here. So what ends up happening um, in this case is that let's say you were to bring um, a, a a non-competitive inhibitor and it was to bind to the enzyme, it wouldn't allow... <laughs> I forgot that was there. It would prevent actually this from happening because this little blue substrate couldn't fit into this site. It would distort it and then you wouldn't end up getting your products. So that's non-competitive inhibition. And with that, my friend, we are done. Hopefully this has lent you some clarity on proteins, function, and structure. Thanks for watching.